Uh, if you're watching this podcast online, I recommend that you check out this short video clip first. It'll get you in the mood for a trip to Pompeii and our look at Roman wall painting. If you're in class, you've already seen it, I assume. When I showed you the famous mask and coffin of King Tut, I mentioned that he was really only a minor teenage pharaoh and that his temple probably, as a result, only yielded what the Egyptians would have considered a second-class hall. And still, the loot that was uncovered just boggles our mind. Well, the same is almost certainly true of Pompeii. This the city on the outskirts of Rome did indeed have prominent and wealthy citizens, but it was really just a suburb. What makes the finds at Pompeii so incredible is the window they opened to ordinary Roman life, Roman families, Roman homes, and the world revealed by the best preserved Roman paintings, paintings that ironically survived precisely because they were buried in ash for almost a thousand years until they were unearthed, excuse me, for more than a thousand years before the until they were unearthed in the 1800s. Uh, by the way, you'll need to know these archaeological discoveries came in the 18th century. Later, much later in the course, you'll learn about how the works unearthed in Pompeii helped generate a neoclassical revival in European art. We'll worry about that after Christmas, okay? Just remember 18th century excavations. Hint, hint. I usually delete material from these hyper-busy slides, but I actually thought all these arrows and diagrams would prove helpful. Yes, you do need to know about Roman houses, including some of these screwy-sounding rooms. I just finished trolling through five past AP tests for questions on Rome, and yes, some of these terms did show up. I was surprised, in fact, by how often these Pompeii painted rooms appeared on past AP tests. This is something you should know, and indeed, it's going to be trickier once you're further into the course to differentiate between, say, Roman painted uh, mural rooms and those of the early Renaissance or late Gothic period. So that's something you're going to want to keep in mind. Anyway, fortunately, you do not have to memorize individual houses. They do tend to have fun names, uh, but you don't necessarily have to know them. The couple, by the way, celebrating a silver wedding anniversary were not the original occupants of the house, but the archaeologists excavating the site. I thought that was kind of cool. So this is a plan for a home of a wealthy Roman. Uh, obviously, the poor Romans wouldn't have this many rooms or that many garden features, for example. But in this home, one would enter through a narrow foyer, which is called the fosses. Our word faucet comes from the same uh, same word. The most important public room, and this is a term you definitely need to know, is the large atrium, which you also see pictured on the bottom right. The open space at the back of the house, surrounded by a peristyle of columns, is a more private garden space open to the outdoors, and it often has an impluvium, uh, which is a Roman pool. You see a picture of that also also on the bottom right, uh, and in fact on the one above as well. Now, if you're wondering why Romans had a home office a couple of millennia before computers, it's because prominent Romans would often hold audiences or meet with clients in their homes. Remember that much of Roman business and politics revolved around sort of patron-client relationships. Oh. And we see some of these terms showing up here. I have them on my printed slide already, and you probably do too. Oh, I couldn't resist throwing this in. My husband and I visited Pompeii this past May. And we also, by the way, climbed to the top of Mount Vesuvius, which fortunately for me, maybe not for you, uh, refrained from erupting while we were doing that. Uh, I recommend you put Pompeii on your list. You're going to hear a lot about my list. I'm going to start plowing through those complicated painting styles in just a minute. But to set the stage, uh, here is a video introduction to Pompeii that should also give you a much better sense of how Roman cities and homes were laid out. You'll see several computer-aided temple reconstructions, which I also find interesting and kind of fun. Uh, if you're in class, of course, uh, you'll be seeing that now. Okay, now we do move into the styles of Roman wall painting. Uh, and you are going to have to have a sense of how the styles change. Uh, I didn't see a question that said, which is this first, second, third, or fourth style, but I haven't seen all the AP tests. I do think you want to try to have these down. This is the House of the Samnite, but again, you don't have to know house names. Uh, as far as I can tell, you don't need to know the names of any houses just to recognize their architectural features and painting styles. That's enough. So how would you define this style? What are its characteristics?
Well, you see the definition here, masonry style that imitates the appearance of expensive marble panels placed on wall surface using painted stucco relief. Each panel is also outlined with stucco. The cornices are also modeled in stucco. In other words, uh, there are raised architectural features around the painting. The painting itself does not imitate these architectural features. They are built on top of the wall. Uh, you should know the cornices, by the way. I actually added that in and made the slide even busier, not my usual approach. Note that the cornice is not painted on, but again, molded in stucco. Uh, we will see architectural features painted on in a way that mimics depth when we go on to other uh, styles. The term for panels that are painted to look like marble is marbleized. That's not tough, is it? And notice that marbleized is not something that gives an impression of depth. It gives an impression of the style of the surface. You may need to know that. Hint, hint. First, looking at that upper left-hand painting, what is going on here? And why might the owner, who owned a vineyard, uh, as we just saw, be a little concerned about who visited this room? You should remember some of this from uh, the podcast. Well, it's a Dionysian mystery writer, or at least that's what our archaeologists and art historians have assumed based on the physical evidence. Mystery religions were not altogether approved at this period. We're still fairly early in the Roman Empire, actually a little ahead of where we are otherwise in the class. Uh, the Dionysian rites also had some pretty strong sexual connotations, so how acceptable they were depended on one's sexual mores. Anyway, do you remember what term your textbook gives for the second style? It's illusionism. Oops, we'll move on here. Uh, basically, artists want to give the illusion that the walls of the room disappear and visitors can step into painted scenes. The style uses flat walls instead of stucco and relies on perspective to create depth. So, in fact, I'm actually going to move back for a second to look at these uh, more carefully. What are some of the devices you see for using perspective to create depth? And by the way, if you're wondering, this is a topic that the College Board cares about. The answer is yes, it cares about it a lot. And as I mentioned before, wall paintings from Pompeii also show up on several tests. Okay. Oops. We'll talk more about perspective when we get to the Renaissance, but you should recognize it in Roman painting. Basically, with single-line perspective, all receding lines in a composition converge on a single point It's in the, in the background of the painting, giving an illusion of depth to a flat surface. And this helped create the picture window impression that these artists were going for. By the way, the Romans didn't get single point perspective exactly right most of the time. It's going to be in the Renaissance that painters become much more mathematically accurate. Although, interestingly, they go back uh, to Greek science to do that, to Pythagoras. Uh, and again, you see a definition of the second style wall extending the space of the room beyond the wall using single point linear perspective and generally speaking second style wall painting has a narrative this is actually my favorite style not that you probably care uh, here's another kind of perspective i warned you we would get to this it showed up in an earlier test and you hadn't had the term yet so i told you to look it up uh, but here's a basic definition as colors go into the distance two th go into distance two things happen first the colors become cooler uh, and they get lighter in value. So a dark shadow in the distance is never as dark as the shadow at your feet. And this is what's, this is, uh, atmospheric and it's sometimes referred to as aerial perspective, although that's also term is also used for the perspective from above. So that's a little confusing. Uh, and I actually think it's clearer to see that. And this is a photograph. Uh, I just grabbed it off the internet. I was actually thinking that atmospheric perspective creates a smoky effect, so I went looking for pictures of the Smoky Mountains, and I thought this one illustrated it quite perfectly. Uh, notice how the mountains in the distance are bluer, which is a cooler color even than green, and they're also softer and smokier, more vague. Uh, that is atmospheric perspective. I think that's an easy one, actually, once you know what, what you're talking about. Uh, here's another example of atmospheric perspective. 
uh, this time from a painting. So uh, again, objects closer to the viewer have more detail and are modeled with highlights and lowlights to create an illusion of depth. And then as you move further out, the colors fade, they become cooler, and the objects become uh, less distinct. And by the way, you see that when you take a photograph or even when you just look into the distance. Uh, here are some more uh, examples of atmospheric perspective uh, and also of second style uh, painting and the way that it often depicted nature and had, you know, essentially had the viewer moving back into a natural scene. Now, I'm a gardener, so I love these second style paintings. These are from the Villa of Livia. I didn't see this on a past AP test, but I could actually imagine you being asked to identify that. Uh, you've already seen a podcast on these paintings, and the reason I think they might show up in an AP exam is because this is a person whose name you might need to recognize, and she is... She was Augustus Caesar's wife, actually a somewhat controversial and interesting figure in history. You might want to Google her and uh, find out she had an interesting life. Note that while the Romans were mostly confirmed city dwellers, art and literature often extolled the joys and virtues of living in the country surrounded by nature. Of course, the kind of people who could afford these nature paintings did not actually have to hoe or weed the nature in their country homes. They had slaves do that. Okay, this is from a villa near Pompeii. What do you observe, and how would you identify third-style painting? It's, I think, very distinctive. And by the way, you see one of the features blown up uh, to get a sense of the detail that was included in really in very miniature form. Okay, here again, you see the definition. Pictorial illusion uh, is confined to framed images, and even the framing is painted on. Remember that before, the fra in the first uh, style, the framing was stucco and it was applied onto the walls. So the overall appearance is flat rather than 3D. This is not attempting to employ perspective or depth. Mostly monochrome, that is single color backgrounds. Uh, so for this style, you should try to remember the framing and also the very thin columns, which are just called columnettes. That's easy to remember. Also notice that this style does not really attempt to create an impression of depth. And again, you see the blown up detail. Okay. Complicated enough for you? Oops. I skipped ahead. So what do you notice here? These are both, hint, hint, College Board favorites, uh, the Golden House of Nero and the Ixion Room, which is in Pompeii. So what do you see? Well, is that definition complicated enough for you? I think it'll be easier to remember that what chiefly characterizes fourth style is that it doesn't have a single style. Throw them all in, seems to be the artist's motto. Notice that the third style's frames persist, but there's a return to illusionism and especially aerial perspective or atmospheric perspective. Now, when we get to Nero, you'll have a better idea of why such a garish style was associated with his rule. And again, what's the word for taking a bit of everything from columns A, B, and C, whatever works best? Eclecticism. And again, it was one of the real talents of the Romans. They were willing to adopt features from other cultures when they worked well. Actually, I would argue Americans have the same talent. Uh, there was a big controversy about 15, 20 years ago when some Japanese politician unwisely referred to Americans as a mongrel culture, uh, a real mixed breed. And I think a lot of Americans rightly took that as a compliment. Uh, we are also a society that embraces eclecticism. The Ixian Room, by the way, takes its name, a nickname from the mythological portrait on one wall. Ixian is trying to seduce Jupiter's wife, Hera, and in punishment, Jupiter ties him to a perpetually spinning wheel. Kind of a nice, gruesome Roman god story. Um, Take a break from my disembodied voice and listen to an art history professor at Yale talk about this room. You will not be surprised that she knows more about it than I do. Here you see more mythological scenes, this time in mosaic. Uh, and I'm going to make a confession. I 
when I looked at both the Roman wall paintings and the mosaics that are from Pompeii, most of which are now actually in the Archaeological Museum in Naples, which we visited, I thought the mosaics were in many ways more beautiful and more amazing. The artistic effects, the shading, the perception of depth that artists created with little bits of tile or stone really boggled my mind. Uh, on the same trip that took me to Pompeii this past May, most of the time we spent in Sicily, and we visited uh, a Roman villa in Sicily uh, that's the largest single collection of Roman mosaics that's still extant in the world, unfortunately got buried in mud and therefore survived. Uh, this was a huge villa, multiple rooms. Uh, and in the next slide, I'm going to show you some of these images, which are not in your textbook, but I just thought they were so great. By the way, the villa it was 4th century AD, so that's the very end of the Roman Empire. We're a little out of sequence here, but I don't believe that mosaics appear as a subject again. One other note, by the way, that Alexander conquering Darius mosaic that we actually showed in the Greek sequence uh, was actually uh, found in a Roman villa. You know, I could not find a better reproduction of this, and I'm sorry, but yes, it actually is a fourth, a fourth century mosaic of a person skiing. I thought that was so cool. Somewhere on the internet, there must be a better picture. This was a little teeny thumbnail, and when I tried to blow it up, it didn't resolve very well. This, on the other hand, uh, is probably the most fa part of the most famous mosaic at the Villa Casale, which is the name of the place. Uh, and this is, you might, as you might expect, the mosaic that shows up on all the t-shirts. This is actually just what it looks like. It was apparently, here's a larger picture of the panel. My husband took this one, uh, hence the somewhat odd angle. Um, this was in a room that was used for exercise, almost certainly used, by the way, uh, for men to exercise, and they got to look at girls scantily dressed. What doesn't change? Uh, here is a hunting scene. Again, I, what is accomplished with mosaic just amazes me. And here is another hunting scene. I thought that the depiction of the animal was particularly excellent. I know you recognize this painting, right? It's a husband and a wife. It's ordinary people, not nobles, and they are carrying symbols of literacy. Uh, the video talks about how this might have been a sign that she kept the books. The textbook explains that it might have been a couple of modest means and social stature trying to show themselves as being educated, perhaps even more educated than they are. Of course, we don't know. Uh, so it's all guesswork. Uh, but all of those facts are good to keep in mind. This is another one of those images that the College Board really likes. Now, the still life was going to be very, it was very rare. We'll see a lot more of them, but not for more than a thousand years. But notice how beautifully this Roman artist renders volume and clear water. Again, this is from Fourth Style Wall Painting. Uh, you, a term that you need to know, uh, and I didn't actually see in this chapter, but it is in fact going to show up on the AP test, just so you know, uh, is modeling. And it's actually very simple. It, it, when it's used to describe painting, it means giving a flat painted surf subject a sculptured look, showing depth. And notice that this is done by shading, it's done by overlapping, but in particular, it's done by shading and foreshortening and other features that attempt to create a three-dimensional impression on a two-dimensional space. And now we will move on to the Roman Empire and more symbols of power and authority.